morning, everyone here at Faith Life Church. Great to have you today. It's a great day to be alive. Great day to be alive. Good things happening. Would you do me a favor? Let's welcome our PAL campus right now. Great to have PAL with us. Great to have you guys. And our online campus, great to have you all over the world joining us today. It is awesome. We've already had two services. They've been awesome. I'm sure this is going to be great as well. How many can remember we have been in the middle of a, a series that's been about two years long? <laughs> I've traveled. I come back. I hit the series. I travel, you know. So who can tell me the, the name? What are we talking about? Occupation. Occupy. Occupation. And what scripture are we talking about? Where do we get that phrase from? Now, if you're new here, we won't require you to have all the answers. But if someone sitting next to you is not new here, they're supposed to have the answers. So anyway. Luke chapter, 19. verse number 11. Yes. The phrase, occupy till I come. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. He gave an analogy, a story, a parable, if you will, of a nobleman going away and coming back as a king. Of course, he's talking about himself. And he said, while I'm gone to occupy till I come. Now, obviously, he's talking to us, the church. So you have your marching orders. But what does that mean? Now, we've covered, I think, three weeks of that already. This is four. So the word occupy in the dictionary means to fill a space. You are sitting in your chair. You fill the space. No one else can take it. So if we were to fill the space in the earth realm, what are we filling it with? On earth, as it is in heaven, right? We are bringing the government of God to bear in the earth realm, heaven to earth. That is what we do. We are occupying. I said that so many people misinterpret that. They think that when Jesus said that, he's talking about conquering the devil, you know, taking on the devil. And I said, why? He has no authority. We have all the authority. The conquering's already been done. Jesus didn't say, go conquer while I'm gone. He said to occupy. You cannot occupy unless you understand what occupy means. So we're going to dig into that and keep going through that. Occupy is a completely different mindset than conquering. We need to understand what it means. It means delegated authority and administration. Think of a government. Jesus is the head of a government. It is coming into the earth realm. And so if you think of delegation and administration, think of an org chart, okay? An organizational chart. We, we have 100 employees here. So we have an org chart. Your company has an org chart. Your family has an org chart. You have someone in charge. We understand the flow of what? <clears throat> Authority flows through an organizational chart. When Jesus is talking about a government, he's talking about how does the authority of the king, dominion, dominion, king's dominion, how does it flow through the organization of his government to ensure every citizen has the benefits promised and what is required to be a citizen. So, for instance, in May of last year, our governments in this nation had about 24 million employees, counting state, local, and federal employees. Now, what is their job? Their job is to make sure that the will of the government, the head of the gov- the, gov- the laws are simulated into the population, and they are ensuring that they are taking place, benefits, that the citizens have all the benefits, and that they're not allowing, you know, people to violate the law and hurt the citizens, at least they're supposed to. And so we have a government. All right. Now, in our review of government, we told a story, Matthew chapter 8, which we've covered several times. We'll probably cover many more times as through this series because it illustrates what I'm talking about. So if we think of government, we think of positions. So of those 24 million positions in our federal government and local governments, those positions are different. Would you agree? People are holding different uh, responsibilities, different talents needed, and different places. 
So we're talking about delegated authority. Delegated authority, again, I'll get back to Matthew 8 in a second, but delegated authority is inferring that when you have been given a place to occupy, you have the authority to occupy it. If you hold an office, you have the authority. If the government gives you a position, they also give you the authority to occupy and fulfill that place, correct? Okay. So when I say the term delegated authority, we're talking about, yes, we have been given authority over the enemy. Everyone has that. But in an organizational mode, as far as maintaining position, occupying a space, we have authority over certain things. I don't have authority over your home. I don't have authority over your kids. You have authority, right? So to understand occupation, we need to have an understanding of where I fit in this puzzle. Okay. So going back to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, the centurion, uh, verse number 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion said, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just what? Say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And that one, I say, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. We spent quite a bit of time of talking about saying. We are seated with Christ. Remember, we're seated with Christ on the right hand of the Father. So we have his authority. We have that position. Now, he's the head of the church. So because he's the head of the church, he is going to give us the position and marching orders for us individually to take position in his government. Okay? But how does a king rule? We talked quite a bit about that. A king is seated. He gives by decree. And the government backs it up. The soldiers, or in this case, the heavenly angels back it up. But we are in that position of authority. If we have the authority and we know we have it, there's no fear, right? No fear. We spent quite a bit of time of telling us, uh, telling you that you do not need to be afraid of the devil. He has absolutely no authority. In fact, the Bible says we can trample on him. We don't have to pay. That mean, basically, that means give him no thought. Stay on assignment, right? Okay. Delegated authority, in this story of, of um, this centurion, we said and have been saying that he receives a command. Now, the head of that government, the Roman government, is who? Caesar. Caesar. If he receives a command from his commanding officer, it sounds like Caesar's voice, right? And if he gives a command to those under him, it sounds like Caesar's voice, okay? And if it doesn't sound like Caesar's voice, we have a problem, if you start adding something to Caesar's voice or you disagree with Caesar's voice, the whole system has collapsed. Is that right? Exactly. I understand. Write this down. Power flows through the conduit of authority. Power flows through the conduit of authority. All right? So understand that. So this is key. If you are Satan and you have no power... You've been stripped of your power. How would you wage war against the body of Christ? Through deception. 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 All right. If a centurion would be, he is a centurion, but if he goes over to another regiment and starts bossing them around, what would happen? I mean, he has the, the outfit, he has the right verbiage, he is a centurion. Caesar has given him that position, but we talked last time about jurisdiction, remember? He doesn't have jurisdiction over that other regiment. This story in Matthew chapter 8, this centurion has authority over his servant because the servant is dependent on him for his life. So he can pray for his healing because spiritually he has jurisdiction. So we, jurisdiction is a whole other topic I'm not going to get into in much detail. But we need to understand it somewhat to understand how a kingdom operates. You have jurisdiction, an assignment, a place. You have the authority in that place but not in someone else's place. So again, we need to have, understand that power flows through the conduit of authority 
And authority flows through the conduit, if you will, of order or proper positioning, as it would be. All right, I want to read the scripture. James chapter 1, verse 16. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find what? You'll find what? Disorder. Disorder and then what? All right, so let's, how many want evil works? Nope, nope, nope. The devil does, right? And so he's going to try to pull you out of order. He's going to try to break the chain of command. He's going to try to insert himself into this situation to lure you out of your position or to motivate you to take a position you're not called to take or you're not mature enough to take. He's going to stop the flow of power that is intersecting his kingdom here on earth and he is going to try to deceive people out of their position or intimidate them out of their position or blackmail them out of their position. We'll be talking about all of these things down to the next couple weeks. But the bottom line is he does not want you in position. So for instance, now that you understand kingdom, if I send someone to the hospital to pray for you, someone says, well, I thought Pastor Gary is coming. I was there. I was there. See, we have not been taught that. No, I want Pastor Gary to come. I was there. I gave this person delegated authority, which means I gave him my authority, my authority, my anointing, my grace. He has my grace to go pray for you. Jesus said, you've seen the Father, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But see, we've not been taught that, have we? Not been taught that. Especially in our American culture, we've not been taught that. But that's how it works. So delegation. Someone who has authority must give you authority. You cannot delegate authority you don't have. You cannot walk in authority that has not been given to you. Satan wants to stop this flow of power through deception. Now let me, he's so subtle, it happens, we've been trained so uh, incorrectly, but I want to give you an example, and I want to give Drenda the credit for this. You know, Drenda, she's quite the preacher, right? I, I get to hear her every day, it's amazing. <laughs> she always says, you always just preach my notes. Well, that saves me a bunch of time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, she's a great encourager. But she does operate in the prophetic, and I love that about her. But she had this revelation one day that just like, oh, my goodness. And the picture of, can you put that on the wall, the medical picture that we use for our, um, you remember the story of the plague of serpents that came on the nation of Israel because they sinned? And Moses put, said, put a pole up with a serpent on the pole, and whoever looks at that pole uh, will be healed and, and freed from this these serpents that are poisonous, right? You got, remember that in the Old Testament? And as Drenda was reading this, the Lord said, do you think those snakes were alive that he put on the pole? Of course not. Are these snakes dead? No. They're not dead. Dead snakes do not curl up a pole. They hang limp, Dead. It's interesting how Satan hijacks the rainbow, a promise of God, hijacks the medical symbol of life and puts two snakes on it that are alive. If you begin to understand how he infiltrates insurance policies, an act of God killed so many people at the hurricane last year, or, you know, he infiltrates our thinking, deception is subtle. He has to break that chain of authority. He has to stop that power. So we're going to talk about some of the ways he does that. The number one way he does it is through basic ignorance, okay? Just ignorance. So many believers are still praying to God about their problem in the sense, God, you do something about it. You do something about this sickness. You do something about this poverty. You do something about not realizing that he's already given them the authority to deal with it. Whatsoever you bind on earth, heaven backs up. Whatsoever you loose on earth, heaven backs up. What are you binding? What are you loosing? He's given you the keys to the kingdom. You have that authority. But so many people, God allows bad things to happen. God kills people. God does, I mean, we're, base, we're down here at basic 101, friend, even below 101. 
The body of Christ is so weak because they do not understand the basics of kingdom. They do not understand where they are. How would they ever be able to rule over or lead someone else? It's not possible. So let's, let's go on. We did say this, I think, a week ago. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be alert and sober-minded. The word sober in the Greek means calm and controlled. Why can you be, how can you be calm and controlled dealing with the enemy? Because you know he has no authority and you have all the authority. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Looking for someone who de- to devour. I acknowledge that he is an enemy. But I must also acknowledge he has been completely, utterly destroyed. His authority does not exist in my life. I am outside of his jurisdiction. And though I recognize him as an enemy, what he is saying is recognize his plot to pull you out of the kingdom into his territory by invoking fear. A roaring lion invokes fear. But not for those who know who they are. James chapter 1, verse 6. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Circumstances, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. If you had a business, are you going to put some employee on the front line who is unstable? If you were commanding an army, would you give an assignment, a vital, many lives matter on the line assignment to someone you know is unstable, who does not know how to handle his sword? No, you would not. But the body of Christ, most people in the body of Christ do not know how to handle the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us the, the, the body armor. Paul uses an analogy of the Roman armor, you know, the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness, you know, the helmet of salvation, all these things are typically defensive, rejecting the lies of the enemy. But the sword of the Spirit is when you go take territory and set captives free by bringing truth to that person. Truth, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And we have the body of Christ on defense instead of on offense. Most Christians are on defense. They're still learning their authority to keep the devil out of their house. Well, until you learn that, please do not bring anyone else under your command, okay? Because you're unstable in all your ways. You know what's going to happen? Unstable, one day you'll say God doesn't, one day he doesn't. I guess my theology is wrong. Sometimes the the demons don't leave. You will change your theology or or you'll change churches. You must first learn who you are in this kingdom before you can take an assignment to occupy anything. That's important. All right. Well, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm still afraid. Well, that's fine. Everyone grows, grows up and learns who they are. But you have to win that battle. You have to win the private battle before you can take a public battle. Goliath was not David's first day out. He actually took the bear and the lion on with his hands. The Bible says he took the hair of that bear and killed it. No, David was not immune. He had been involved with some pretty impressive situations already. Goliath was just another situation. It was not his first day out. I like that God teaches us when no one knows our name, though. This is family. You can make mistakes in here. You can grow up in here and learn how this works. But God's not going to send you on an assignment to occupy territory on behalf of the kingdom when you're unstable, wavering back and forth. Well, does God, can I trust God? Can I trust, you know, and wait, no, you, you're, no, you're, You're staying put. But pastor, I don't like my job. You're staying put. In fact, the more you don't like your job, the better. Because you're learning submission with a good heart. And you're learning to do things unto the Lord. Until you do things unto the Lord, he can't trust you. 
I know this is exciting stuff, isn't it? It's like, (laughs) it is exciting stuff though. You must win the private battle before God will put you in the public battle. Amen. God is protecting not only you, he's protecting his name as well. Amen. Luke chapter 16, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy handling money, who will trust you with spiritual riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? So you're in training. You're going to start out in training. I don't like my boss. See, here's, here's you got to change your mindset. If you want to be effective, can the boss trust you with his company, with his paycheck? I don't like my boss. That's beside the point, probably better. Because you're going to honor the Lord with your obedience. And the Lord is the one who promotes you. He knew where Joseph was in prison. He he knew where Moses was out out in the field. He knew where David was with the sheep. He knows your name. Don't you think he knows your name? He knows your name. He knows where you're at. And he uses these things to train you because you cannot have authority unless you're submitted to authority, right? So you're going to learn these things in life. So let me ask you, this is a government. So in a government, there's someone over you and someone under you. So who is it that you report to? Who has the ability to correct you? Who holds you accountable? We need to understand how things operate in life. So number one is ignorance. Learning who you are in Christ is the first step to being promoted into a place of occupation. Number two, I believe, is the the next one I believe is the greatest threat to the body of Christ. Paul dealt with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The church in Corinth is a very immature church. Everyone say the word immature. Immature. That means they're not mature, right? They're not mature. It doesn't mean they're not um, heading that way. It just means they're not there yet. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is teaching this church with this letter. He says, brothers, I could do, verse number one, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere babies in Christ. Now, he says this, I gave you milk and not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. What does a baby do with solid food? They spit it out. Or again, they change churches. (laughs) I'm just telling you how it is. All right. Indeed, you're still not ready, he said. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling. Jealousy and quarreling over what? Position. Visibility. Who's more spiritual than someone else? If this is going on, are you not just worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when someone says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God made it grow. So God's interested in what? God is interested in growth. And these people have to take their positions. Paul is talking about how people work together And he's teaching them. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. And each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. But Paul says, by the grace, which means God's empowerment. By God's empowerment, God has given me. I laid a foundation as an expert builder. See, everyone has grace. Every assignment has God's empowerment with it. And one of the plots the enemy uses is to pull you out of that grace. So for instance, I am not administrative. If I have to do administrative things very long, my brain begins to get tired. Anyone else relate to things like that? But it's amazing. I have people on staff who love administration. They love it, love it, love it. I think that's weird. How can you love administration? The Bible says he gives people different giftings. They love it. 
So I say, here's what the enemy wants to do. Pull you out of your grace. Now, I can teach all day because I am passionate about the kingdom. I love teaching the kingdom. I can teach all day. At the end of the day, I'll be tired, but I'll be enthusiastic. I will be, I'll have more energy at the end of the day than I do at the beginning of the day because I'm in my grace. I'm in the grace. But you know what it feels like when you're outside your grace, right? You got to take a nap. You know, you might have friends that call you and dump all their problems on you. You know what that feels like, right? They suck the life out of you. Come on, right? The enemy loves to draw you out of your grace. That's called false responsibility. He wants to drag you into false responsibility that you have no grace for, no empowerment by God for, and you're trying to solve all their problems when you step out of your position. Now, we're going to talk about how the enemy pulls us all out of position because it's a plot. And we're going to learn that in this series. But nevertheless... Paul is talking here that there's grace for a position, an assignment that God gives you. But let's look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Same book, same church, same people he's talking to. And let's find out some more that he's telling them. I think we can relate to this as well. Chapter 12, verse number 14. No, it's still 12. 12, 12. The body is a unit. And though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews, Greeks, slave, or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one but part, but of many. But if the foot, underline the next two words, if the foot what? If the foot should say... Because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear, what should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Where would it be? Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So when it says, say to the hand and say to the feet, who are they talking to? Who are they saying to? Their fellow churchgoers. See, the church of Corinth was immature, right? We already know that. Paul says, I can't even talk to you as spiritual. In other words, they can't even receive a revelation of their assignment yet. They can't even receive a revelation of their destiny yet. You know why? Because they would all blab how great they are. They're all still fighting over who, who's uh, speaking in tongues more than they are, uh, who is. Who's, who has more spiritual giftings, you see, and uh, Paul or Apollos, and they, they have missed the entire point. It's not about them. It is about God. And he is the one that puts them in position. And they're out of order. And every evil work now can flow in that place, right? And Paul's trying to correct this church. Yes. I had a lady once, back in the beginning of the church, we had a prayer meeting, and uh, she comes up, shocked me, her face was red. She comes up in tears. Why didn't you call on me to pray? Was I obligated to call on you to pray? Now, in light of our understanding, who's in charge of that meeting? I am. Who has the authority over that meeting? I do. Who decides on who to call on? I do. I didn't tell her she was going to pray. I never even brought up that she might even be called on to pray. And here she is in tears. Why didn't you call on me to pray? And I said to her, because of how you're acting is why I did not call on you. Because it's all about you. To be seen as spiritual. Because it's an identity thing with you. You're trying to get your identity from spiritual gifting. 
you're out of order. That's not how it works. So how should it work? Okay, pastor, you didn't call me. What can I do to help? Clean toilets? What do you need? What do you need? Now, you can stay in a place of immaturity or you can choose to grow, right? And we choose to grow. Colossians chapter 2. It's amazing, though, when you... Okay, people that are immature don't realize they're immature, okay? <laughs> they, don't, they don't realize it. Uh, let's go to Colossians 2. We'll get into this. Now, I'm trying to help you here, friend. I know you want to grow. I know you want to reach your destiny and how to occupy. This is vital to your life, and it's, it's vital that we understand this, especially in today's culture. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, which is what? Pride. And the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Now, there's a prize when you fulfill your assignment, right? Okay. So how, do, how, does someone disqualify, how does someone disqualify you for your prize when it's not their task and it's your task? How do they disqualify you? Because they make you feel insignificant spiritually, unable they're so spiritual, and you look at yourself, and you go, I'm, I'm nothing. I, 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 you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have words of knowledge very often. I don't, I don't have dreams very often. Spiritually, you know, you, you give up. You just, you, you just give up. You're, just, you're uh, intimidated by them to view yourself in a different light. Is that making sense? Okay. So you, just, you disqualify yourself is what happens. You disqualify yourself. Such a person goes into great detail about what he or she has seen, and their unspiritual mind puffs them up with idle notions. Have you ever met a Christian who is always telling you the dream they had last week? Or God spoke to me this morning and told me to wear the pink, you know, whatever, the red shirt. or the. He talks to me every day, all day long. Okay, and let's say he does do that. Why are they telling you that? You got the memo. He said, wear the red socks. You wear the red socks. Case closed. Why do you have to come to church and tell everybody, God told me to wear the red socks? What color did he tell you? I didn't hear God talk to me today. I, I, he didn't say anything to me about that at all. You know, I don't, wow. Well, me and God are really tight. You ever met someone like that? Stay away from them. They're immature. In fact, the Bible goes on and says they're puffed up, their mind, they're uns. Now, they would argue they're, they look very spiritual, right? Yes? Help me out. Yes? Very spiritual. The gifts. Listen, God promotes based on character, not giftings. They do have a gift, but they are not mature. They are not ready, Okay. So it says this, they have been puffed up, their unspiritual mind, yet they, they're so spiritual, right? They're so spiritual, intimidating, they're so spiritual. <clears throat> but the Bible says they're not. Their unspiritual mind is puffed up with idle notions. What's an idle notion? I'm better than they are. I should run that department. They should have had me teach that class. They should have, they should have had me sing on the platform. I can sing better than that person. I can teach better than pastor. I should be pastor of the church. I, so here's the deal. You're not pastor of the church. That spot is occupied. <laughs> that spot is occupied. <laughs> but here it goes on. It says, they have lost connection Read it. With the head. How does authority flow? From the head down. But they have lost connection with the head. 
Lost connection. We don't want that. So what happens next is that person goes to other baby Christians and starts, we just read in 12, I should be the hand. I should be the head. I should be the eye. Right? You've all heard it. I don't know why they did that. I don't know why they put them there. I don't know why I should be, you know. Here's the thing I want you to understand. The eye was already an eye before it was born. Hello? See, you're discovering that place. But God already has created you for that place. But he can't reveal it to you until you mature enough to receive it. And it's all about God. And it's not about you. Okay? So, in occupation, we need to understand that God will give us assignments. They will start in small parts. We will gain credibility with God, trustworthiness with him. We will be promoted by those he's put over us. We'll see that diligence. And God is in charge. He will move you and you will change assignments as you mature. But nevertheless, there is a process to that. But occupying territory requires delegated authority and administration. Administration. It begins with an understanding that you are part of a body. That it's not all about you, but we all have a part to play in that occupation. Just like a government, you have positions, and need to, you need to understand this too. If you are leading people, Satan will send people and God will send people. Satan will send people. If you have a business, Satan will send people. If you have a church, Satan will send people. And they look very talented and they're always, almost always very flattering. I don't care what they say or their credentials. They need to be tested first before you put them in position. Right? Yes? Yes. So that's how life works. And we'll continue next week with other areas where Satan tries to disrupt the flow of God's power. He tries to get you off. We'll talk more about those things like false responsibility and how your, how your authority is hijacked and all the ways he tries to get you out of position. But I am determined as your pastor to help you understand your position and how to occupy it. And then as one body, we can get a lot done. Amen? Amen. It'll be a great story. Amen. Well, stand with me today. Obviously, God created you. He knows the plans he has for you. And we are discovering those things as our maturity qualifies. Remember, Paul says, I can't speak to you as spiritual. I can't, I can't, I can't tell you. Th- I can't speak to you as spiritual. You're still down here in the baby stage. You're still being enamored by people's giftings and titles and images. And that's where the world's at now. You know, but we've got to grow our character and he wants to help us grow. And so he can speak to us with spiritual truths. Remember it says, if you handle worldly wealth with credibility and integrity, you qualify. You're going to learn in the natural things first. You're going to learn. He's going to, the natural training comes first where you qualify for the spiritual training. So that's how it works. Well, pastor, where's my assignment at? Where are you at right now? Well, I just worked down at some sub shop. Great, you'd be the very best sub maker on the planet then. But pastor, I don't want to be a sub maker. But you are now. Joseph found himself in prison. And he did such a great job. The prison guards, the person over the prison, put him in charge of the prison. His own prison. (laughs) Wherever you're at, you'd be the best as unto God. God sees that. And you just serve the Lord wherever you're at and have joy in it. Have joy in it. Bow your heads with me today. You know, the first step is knowing your creator. You know, everyone's on a mission to find purpose, right? The greatest question we get as pastors is, what am I supposed to do? Well, the Bible says today has enough trouble of its own. You know, just walk one day at a time. God knows your name. He's going to lead you. But knowing him is the first step. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, if you're a pal, and you've never given your life to the Lord, if you're online somewhere, you have never given your life to God, 
You know, it's not complicated. It's not religious. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of Jesus has that right to become a son and daughter of the house. That means you have the inheritance and you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. That means you have legal rights. And life changes. God will help you. I always say it this way. He's going to help you unravel the mystery of you while you're here. He's going to help you find that place, that path. And it's going to be an awesome story. But let's begin back at the beginning. If by chance you are here, we're all going to pray out loud. And you would say, Pastor, I want to be part of this prayer. Would you please include me? I need to say yes. I need God in my life. And I would say amen to that. We're all going to pray right now. But if you'd say, I want to be part of this prayer, just raise your hand really high. Say, Pastor, I want to be in this prayer. Just put your hand up. Thank you for the hands. Hands up. Hands are up. Yes, they are online and at POW. You say, why? Oh, Pastor, I'm online. You can't see my hand. No, but you can. I want you to mark the spot. That's why I have you raise your hand. So you can remember when trouble comes, you're not alone that you have changed kingdoms. You're now under the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is now your counselor. You can pray and receive wisdom and downloads of of, uh, strategies. Life changes. So I want you to remember this date when you said yes. Write it in your Bible. Write it down. It's a very important date that you can hold on to when trouble comes. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. That's awesome. Let's pray. Everyone's going to pray out loud, so just say these words with me. Say, Father, you said in the Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus, you'll receive me. Make me brand new on the inside. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me about life in the kingdom, and I need that. So today I say yes. I call on the name of Jesus. I receive your goodness. Every promise is mine. Based on your word, I am now a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am now a son and daughter of the house of my father, God. And I thank you for it. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Praise the Lord. Well, I trust that was an exciting message for you. Because it always ends good. It really does.